Hey guys, what's going on today? Welcome to Millionaire Mafia. We got something awesome to talk about. This is literally the bedrock of my investing career and how many new investors scale their business into achieving financial wealth and true independence. What we're gonna talk about today is one thing and five steps. And that one thing is called the Burr Method. And the Burr Method is comprised of five steps. Step one, buy. Step two, rehab. Step three, rent. Step four, refinance. And the most important and the best step is step five, which is repeat that process you just did over and over and over again until you create a massive portfolio that you can then cash flow and go sit on the beach and drink Mai Tais or, or go fishing for sailfish in Costa Rica. That's the goal, that's the end state. And the way you get there is by doing the Burr process. This can be used in both residential real estate with single family homes, and it can be used in commercial real estate as well with multiple properties. The cool thing about this video is we're not just gonna be talking about the Burr process in general. We're going to use a real world application of the Burr method. This is actually my first deal I ever did in real estate. This ain't just some guru talking about things that you can theoretically do. This is a guy who's been there, done that, got the bumper sticker, and I'm still doing it today. There's a Chinese proverb that goes, the journey of a thousand miles begins with one single step. And that's what today is all about, taking that first step towards achieving financial wealth. If you saw some of my other videos, you'll know that I started out with very little to no formal or even real world training on how to be a landlord, how to rehab properties, how to talk to banks how to talk to other lenders, how to talk to contractors and things like that. So I was really starting from the beginning, but I was able to find something that worked very well for me. And I, you know, I can only speak for myself, but I would guarantee you it's worked really well for a lot of other people. And that resource that I use was a book that was written by two gentlemen. And the book is titled, Weekend Millionaires, Secrets to Investing in Real Estate. It's also in my top 10 favorite books on a video that I did a little while ago. I'll link that in the description here and you should see that popping up on the upper banner. What I really like about this book is that it's not just a mindset or something that talks in vague terms or descriptions. It literally gives you specific numbers and details and steps and procedures on how to do exactly what I'm gonna talk about today, which is the Burr Method. The best part about it is it goes into the details on the numbers, numbers that most people don't cover. You might have seen a lot of things over the years where people say, oh, you can get in for 10% down, or you can get in, you know, all you gotta do is get a 75% loan to value, and you only have to bring a 25% down payment. And your mortgage is X, and your rental income is Y. As long as your rental income is higher than your mortgage, you're gonna cash flow and you're a great landlord and you're an investor. And sorry, but uh, that's not exactly how it works. We're gonna talk about that today. Let's start out by setting the stage for this process. And we're just gonna go ahead and handle this particular property. I'm not gonna speak in generalities, I'm gonna speak in this specific property. We found this property in late December of 2016 and we closed in early February, and we still own this property today. So let's start with step one. Like I said, we came in with very little knowledge on much about anything with real estate. So we used this book to figure out how we generally wanted to write numbers and things that we should be doing, but we didn't hadn't really done them yet. So we did what many people do, and we called a realtor. At the time, there were still some pretty good properties on the MLS that could be found by even investors. Nowadays, finding a good property that is gonna cash flow or even flip very well is gonna be very difficult to find. So we found a property after looking at a few with this realtor and we said we're gonna make an offer on it. The property itself was listed for 75,000 and it had gone down considerably from about 110,000 over the preceding four or five months. We decided to throw in an offer at $60,000, it was currently listed at 75, and they came back and said, 
70. We didn't like that. We came back in at 65 and they accepted that offer. Now the next step is in order to close that property and actually buy it, we had to find the money to close it. We needed 65,000 obviously to close it, but this property needed rehab. Fortunately for us, it had a brand new roof. It had new copper wiring. So it had been converted from aluminum over to copper. And it had a, a pretty rehab, pretty well nicely rehab ma uh, master bathroom. The rest of the house though was super outdated. Need had wood paneling, had old shag carpet on the floors, mustard yellow countertops and, and no appliances, stuff like that. It, it was in rough shape. We estimated using what we knew about the how much things cost. We just went online and we went to this, went to Home Depot and we figured out how much it was going to cost for this and that and this. And keep in mind, we didn't really know everything, but we, we took our best guess and we used what we learned in this book and we came up with 25,000 to remodel that property. Now we did add into that property, um, you know, some slop. You always want to add in some slop. We typically add about 10% on top just in case we find something. So you, you always, you can see a lot of times what needs to be done, but what you want to account for is things that you just didn't see because you weren't paying attention or that are hidden, things behind walls, things underneath the foundations, things you can't physically see. A lot of guys will talk about what it costs to buy a property and what it costs to rehab the property, and then that's your all in. The problem with that is it doesn't take into all the expenses because you also have closing costs. So in order to buy a property, you have to, whether you get a bank loan or not, you have to pay closing costs. There's taxes, there's, there's transfer uh, fees, there's title insurance fees, and a bunch of other docs and stamps and things like that that you have to pay for. Factor in getting a bank and they are gonna have underwriting fees, they're gonna have appraisals, they're gonna have surveys that need to be done, they're gonna have their points that they charge. We factor that in to be about $5,000. Then you also have holding costs. So you have rehab costs, but while you're holding it, you have things like you have to pay for insurance on that property, you have to have, pay for the utilities, those cost money every month. You're using power, you're using water, you've got trash that's coming in there. And then any other taxes. So during the hold, you're going to have taxes from the time you start, you close the property until the time you put somebody into that property. All in becomes a little bit higher. So that holding cost we ran at $2,500. Most banks are going to give you about a 75% loan to cost or loan to value. On a property that is fixed up, they'll typically do a loan to value, meaning whatever the property is worth, let's say it's worth 100,000, they'll give you 75% of that or $75,000. If you have a property that needs to be fixed up, a lot of times they'll do a loan to cost. So if you have a property that may be worth $100,000, but you paid 50,000, they may only give you 75% of that 50,000. Some banks may roll in the construction cost into that if, it's, if you buy it at a low enough price, but many don't, and this one in particular did not. So we were gonna buy it for $65,000. 25%, which is the amount that we had to bring to the table, was $16,250. So there's our first number. Then we had the $25,000 in rehab, then we had $5,000 in closing costs, and then we had another $2,500 in uh, holding costs. So we needed to come up with $48,750. Okay, so we got the loan approved. We were gonna go get ready to close, but we needed to go find the money. We needed to find $48,750. So we reached out to a family friend who had expressed interest in investing in real estate in general, not even to us or with us a while back. We reached out to these people and said, hey, we, we brought them the project and we said, here's what we're looking to do. Here's how long we expect it to take and here's what the returns that we're willing to give you. They liked it, they signed off, and they gave us $40,000 that they had. So we still had to come up with $8,750. Fortunately, a couple years ago, I had started an IRA, a Roth IRA, and we had about $15,000 total value 
of that, about 12,000 of that was what we had put in, so the basis. The good thing about the basis of your IRA is you can withdraw that without paying that 10% penalty and paying taxes because we already paid taxes on that Roth IRA. So we were able to pull out the $8,750. Now, you could say, okay, Jake, that's, that's your money, and you're right, but it's money that we had not planned on being able to touch for a really long time. And we, through some research, realized that we could pull that out. So yes, there is ultimately $8,750 out of my pocket or out of my net worth that's going into this property. But it wasn't really out of my pocket at the time because I just didn't have it. So the good news is we're fully funded. The bad news is now we've got to move on to step two, which is the dreaded rehab. This was a all hands on deck effort myself, my wife Katie, the kids, my dad came out, flew out from Illinois for a week. My aunt and uncle came out while they were on their visit to come enjoy sunny Pensacola. And it took a ton of YouTube videos. I mean, I literally had to look up a video on how to change a toilet. So you can imagine my experience level and you can see that you don't have to be all that skilled to do this. You just gotta have, uh, you just gotta have the mindset and you gotta have, you know, the willingness to, to take the time and, and get it done, right? And, and we did. So it was a lot of work, uh, long days, short nights, things like that. But after about two months, we were done. And the all-in costs, so our rehab costs were $12,500 for the rehab, which was about half of what we anticipated of that $25,000. We ended up with about $5,000 in total lender costs. I say lender cost because we had planned on spending $5,000 on closing, but in reality, we spent about $2,500 for the lender fees for the loan that we took from the bank, and then the remaining $2,500 was for the private money lender that we used to bring the down payment and the majority of the rehab cost. All in, it was about $5,000. So our total all-in purchase plus rehab plus lender cost plus holding cost was $82,500. Okay, so we know what we're all into this property for. Next step, step three, is rent. The property is done. We need to go find a tenant. We being inexperienced in the rental market and not really knowing much about leases or tenants or how much things would cost or the process and things like that, we hired a management company in our hometown. The management company told us that it was going to be 10% a month of the gross receipts received. Back to this book, you don't have to pay what people ask all the time. It talks about negotiating gambits for management companies. And using some of those things that we learned, we were able to actually get the management fee reduced by 2%. So we actually only ended up paying 8%. We had it rented in a week. Really hot market, they were a nice military couple, and we ended up having them for about 18 months before he had to go on to his next Bill it. The strong lease really helps you out. Now, a management companies can have a very strong lease. We ended up creating our own lease through things that we learned over the years, and we had it reviewed and signed off by our attorney here in the state of Florida. But that's going to keep you safe. That's like your shield for your property. So make sure you have a good lease. Now we move on to step four, which is refinancing the property. Now we already had a loan, but that loan was only at $65,000 which means we had a $52,000 balance on our principal. And we just dumped in 12,500 plus all the money from our IRA. Plus we had a, a money loan that we had to pay off to our lenders. So we need to pull that money out so that we could pay off our lender and pull our money back out that we had invested in this property. And then maybe some more. So we went to another bank and we said, Hey, we want to refinance this property. And the question they ask is, has it been six months since you've owned it? And the reason they ask that is a lot of banks, they have very, 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 very strict and stringent rules and requirements and regulations on what they can do because they sell their mortgage notes to a secondary market. So they're going to be very strict in what they can do. And one of those things is that they have to have a six month seasoning period. So we were beyond six months. We were in August, so right at six months. And what most of those banks will do, they're very, the good thing about them is you can kind of set your watch to them. They'll typically do up to 75% of loan to value, not loan to cost. So that first loan was a loan to cost. 65,000, they gave us 75% of that, which was 52,000. 
This bank, once you have it fixed up and you have a tenant in place, you get a loan to value or LTV, meaning whatever that property is worth after you fixed it up, after an appraiser looks at it, you can get 75% of that. So if your after repair value is more than your all in cost, you can actually pull money out, which is why they call it a cash out. The terms were a 75% LTV, 30 year fix. So that loan was gonna be fixed for 30 years. It wasn't gonna change. So this mortgage will not change. And at four and four and a half percent interest, so 4.5%. That was pretty good, even back then. So the appraisal came back in at $130,000 which is awesome, right? So $130,000, I'm sure you're already typing in your calculator, right? What's 75% of 130,000? The answer is $97,500. And what did we have all into this property? Remember, $82,500. So what's the difference? $15,000, which is awesome. So we paid off our note to the lender. We paid off our money loan to our private investor. And we got to take our $8,750 back, plus we got another $15,000 in the refi. So we had a amount back in our pocket, a check at closing for $23,750. And we still had the property and we were still renting it out. The lender was happy, we paid them off. They're still with us today. They've invested with us multiple times hundreds of thousands of dollars, and they're making money year over year, and I'm happy to write those checks every year. And you will be too when you get this to work. Okay, so we, we bought the property, we fixed it up, we refinanced the property after we rented it. Does it make any money? Does it cash flow is what the term is. Does it cash flow? Does after all the expenses are paid out each month, is there money left over for us to take? Is it worth holding on to it? So let's run those numbers. We end up renting out the property to those first tenants for $1,050 a month. So that's our income. We really have no other types of income. If you have a big property and you, you have laundry or you have other services that can be provided, things like that, amenities that people would pay for, you can you can add those in there. But for the most part, when you have a single family, that's, that's your rent. Now we need to figure out what the expenses are. And some of the other variables are the property management fees, your maintenance and repairs, your CapEx, which is your big ticket items like your roof, your HVAC system, major plumbing stuff, and you could factor in your appliances depending on how you wanna run it because they have a limited life and they're pretty expensive to replace. So let's run our expenses really quick. Our mortgage is comprised, when you have a mortgage with a lender, they're typically in a, what they call escrow, your taxes and your insurance. So you'll, your t they'll, monthly they'll take out one twelfth, right? Your total amount for the year divided by 12. So it'll take one twelfth of what your insurance and taxes for the year would be. And they'll, they'll add that to your principal and interest. So a mortgage really is comprised of four things, principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And for this property, it came out to $652 a month. Now we got to factor in that property management fee but a lot of people do this wrong. We said they charge 8%. So that ends up coming out to on $1,050, $84 a month. And that's it, right? Wrong. Because most people don't realize this, but a property management company typically charges between 40% all the way up to 100% of that first month's rent for a placement fee. Meaning their work in marketing for your tenants having the tenants sign the lease and then giving them the keys and doing all that kind of stuff, they charge 40 to 100% of one month. Ours charged 40%, which was the lowest that I could find. That comes out to $420 off of the first month's rent. So instead of 1050, I got, what is that? Five something, right? So it was considerably less, 590. So you have to take that 420, divide that by 12, because this is gonna happen every year if you get a new tenant. Now, if you have a new tenant that stays, or the same tenant that stays in for a long time, it's not as bad. They still charge, I think, 20%. So now you have to break that amount up. But in this case, I had to pay $420, split it up over 12 payments. So that's $35 a payment. I have to add that into my $84 a month for a total property management fee, effective fee, of $119 a month, which is considerably higher than 84 but still not terrible. Now we have to all, even though that property is occupied, there's a tenant in there, it's occupied. There's no vacancy, right? It's one unit, but there's 
physical vacancy, meaning nobody's there, and there's economic vacancy, meaning the tenant was late on rent or didn't pay all of rent or didn't pay rent at all. That's typically very low in my market. However, you still have to account for it and save up because one month of them somebody not paying $1,000, that is a lot of money over the course of the year. It's not quite $100, but it's almost, it's you know $84, $85 a, year, a month that you have to put away. Typical vacancy in a pretty good market is considered 5%. You could go as high as 10% if you wanted to, and that's not a bad thing as long as you're cash flowing well, but 5% is pretty reasonable. So we did, we did that. That comes out to $55 a month for vacancy. Next, we have to account for repairs. We had just remodeled the property and I thought we did a pretty good job and we had so, you know the roof and the HVAC and things were in pretty good shape and mostly new. So we went with a 5% repair budget. If you have an old property or one that's not very good shape, you might wanna go up to 15 or even 20% just to be safe because you're eventually gonna to have to do it. So that's another $55 a month. Next, we have CapEx, and what CapEx stands for is capital expenditures. Think of CapEx as the major items, the roof, the HVAC, and things like that. Those typically have a 15 to 20 year lifespan, and so you need to break up how much it's gonna cost for you to do that. Let's say it's $10,000, and it's got a 10 year lifespan. You need to break that up over 10 years, so you need to save up thousand dollars total a year in 12 payments right to get to that ten thousand when you're going to need it in 50, 10 or 15 years if it lasts longer great if it doesn't last as long that's why we put a little bit of a buffer in there so that if it only lasts eight years we have the ability to pay that without going out of pocket or coming out of pocket very little <coughs> Because our roof was essentially new, we had just had the wiring redone and the entire house was remodeled, we have a very low CapEx on this particular property. So we also did a 5% CapEx. 5% is typically pretty reasonable, up to about 10%. You usually don't have to go more than 10% on CapEx unless you have something that you know is in really bad shape and you just decided not to rehab it and you know you have limited time. The best case, the best thing to do in that example is just to raise or plan to, the best thing to do in that example is just to have that amount of money set aside when you start the project and build that into your, your numbers when you initially purchase it. Because that is one of those things that could go at any time and you wanna be ready to go. You don't wanna wait on a monthly CapEx uh, allowance to cover that. So that was another $55 a month. When you add all those costs, the property management, the mortgage, the vacancy, maintenance and repairs, and the CapEx, you come to a total expense amount of $936 a month, which means with a $1,050 rent, we had a net cash flow to us that goes into our pocket each month of $114, not too shabby. It's not unbelievable or astronomical or life-changing, but keep in mind, how much money do we have in this deal? big old goose egg, right? Also, you have to consider something else. We have to have that 200 year vision, right? We don't need to think 200 years on this one, but we need to think long term in general. Every year we raise and we have raised our rent by at least $50 a month. Remember the mortgage stays the same. So we've raised our rent $50 every month to meet market. It hasn't exceeded market, we're just keeping up with the market. So now we're at $1,300 a month rent and our expenses are essentially the same at $936. When you do the math on that, you are about $400 a month in cash flow on something that we have all of our money out and has now gone up in value to over $200,000. That is the beauty of the Burr method and that is the true power of the Burr method. I'm hoping you guys are seeing the advantages to the Burr method, but let's go over specifically the things that I see that are beneficial. And then we'll also go over some of the things that could be detrimental or something you need to consider when you become a landlord and start this Burr method. So the benefits of the Burr method, number one, is gonna be that monthly cash flow. We've already got beaten that one up in detail. I'm not gonna cover that anymore. Number two is you have appreciation. Remember we said we bought it at 65, we fixed it up, and then we refinanced it out at 130. Current value is $200,000. Number three, that principal balance, that we owe $97,500 on that mortgage. 
over the years, the tenant has been paying that principal payment off on that mortgage. It's not much. It doesn't start out as much. It's maybe a couple hundred dollars, but that goes up and up and up as the years go down. So over time, that mortgage will only be 80000 then 70000 then 50000 And then over time, over the course of that 30 years, eventually that property will be completely paid off with no money out of our pocket and will still own the property and the rent will have gone up year over year over year and that property will be worth a lot more than 200000 so it's really it's a really cool concept it's just compounding fourth benefit of the burr method is what's called depreciation depreciation is one of the coolest things in real estate because what it does is a lot of people will call it a phantom income and they say phantom income because it's not money that goes into your pocket it's money that stays in your pocket that the irs can't take per the irs the, a residential property has a 27 and a half year lifespan so what you do is you divide the basis that you have in your property by 27 and a half years. Let's say it was worth $100,000. And that's about what we paid for this thing when all was said and done. We get to write off about $3,500 a year off of our taxes. It doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you're in a 40% tax bracket, you're talking about $1,200 to $1,500 that I don't have to pay in taxes. Not a write-off. That's literally twelve to $1,500 in my pocket. That's literally a free month's worth of rent that I'm getting to keep in my pocket because I don't have to pay taxes. The fifth benefit is that you can essentially do this infinitely. You buy the property with your money. You refinance the property back out, and you have that money back in your pocket, plus some more if you've done it correctly. And then you get to go ahead and put it into another property and do it again, and then do it again. The other great thing about this is that you can essentially get an infinite return on your money. Because think about it. I have no money in this property right now. I really can't stress this enough, guys. You have to run your numbers correctly and you have to run them dispassionately. And what I mean by that is be conservative. If you think something is going to cost $1,000, add a buffer to it. At the end, then you won't have to add another buffer on top. You'll have a buffer built into your numbers. Expect things to take longer. Rehabs take longer. Getting a tenant out, if they're not a good tenant, takes longer. Getting a tenant in can take longer. Getting the loan done, a lot of people think it can happen in a couple weeks. It can, but it historically doesn't happen that fast. Everything is negotiable. Everything is negotiable in real estate. The price is just the asking price. It doesn't mean you're always going to get the price reduced, but think about it this way. Back to that initial example. They wanted $75,000 for that property. If I had gone in and said, okay, I'll sign this contract at $75,000, I still would have made money. I still would have had a good deal, but I went in and decided to negotiate, and I ended up settling for $65,000. That's $10,000 difference. You know how long it is going to take at $114 a month to make $10,000? You can't beat that. Negotiating is the best way to make money in real estate. Remember the old adage, you make your money when you buy, you realize your profits when you sell, or in this case, when you refinance. If you haven't bought the property right, you won't make money when you sell or when you refinance down the road. So just keep that in mind. Always negotiate. You need a bulletproof lease. I can't stress this enough. If you go with a property management company that's licensed in your state, you shouldn't have to worry about that. You are protected. It doesn't mean you don't want to still check the lease and ask questions and make comments and things like that, but they're going to have to have their lease set up and they're going to have their own internal or affiliate attorneys that have reviewed that lease and they've been using it and it's probably okay. Trust, but verify. If you're doing your own lease, I am not an attorney. I do not provide any legal advice or counsel. I have created my own lease after learning things over the years, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't work, seeing what I like, what I don't like, tailoring it to the types of properties and tenants that I deal with. I took that product, I gave it to an attorney that I know, like, and trust, and then he reviewed it and he made edits and then he signed off on it and said, this is good and it's in compliance with the state of Florida. So then it's a legit lease and I use it. So a lease is a great way to protect your butt great way to protect your property is going to be through insurance. Insurance for homeowners 
or homeowner's insurance is different than insurance for landlords. For a house that you live in, they call it an HO policy, homeowner's policy. For a property that you rent out or are in the process of rehabbing, they call it a DP. DP is dwelling policy. So it's not a DP policy, it's a, it's a DP. There's gonna be a DP1 or a DP3. Just remember this, a DP1 is when it's vacant and you're rehabbing it. That's basically minimal coverage, it's fire in case something happens while you're you know, working on it and you light a fire and the house burns down. There you go, you're covered up to typically the cash value of that, what you have it insured up to. A DP3, think of that as landlord insurance or tenant insurance, meaning there's a, a tenant in place, it's occupied, now you're insured against the perils, the, the hail, the rain, the you know flooding if required, if you're in that type of an area, uh, hurricanes or tornadoes, things like that, as well as fire. So think of it as normal insurance with a tenant in place. The other thing that I think a lot of guys don't do, and I don't really understand why, is renegotiate your insurance policies every year. I hire a broker, and I don't really hire him. I, I employ a broker, and he gets paid out a commission out of my insurance premium to the insurance company that I that I end up using. So he'll get me a bunch of, of different bids, and they bid against each other. It's a free market, right? If I use one company and then the next year, they're gonna creep up those prices every year. They're just always gonna creep up. But if I renegotiate that, either with that current company or get another company to bid, then they will actually come in and typically go at, or sometimes I've even gone below what I was at the previous year. We have to compare apples to apples coverage, right? You gotta make sure you're getting the same coverage because if you have a lot lower premium but you're getting no coverage, then it's stupid and it's not worth it. There's a lot of ways that you can mitigate your risk. A lot of them I've given you today. If you have any questions about how best to buy a property, how to refinance a property, how to renovate it, how to hire contractors, how to fire contractors, how to find management companies, how to do leases, and the types of tenants that you're looking for, go ahead and drop a comment below. I'll be more than happy to answer anything you guys have. I'm sure there's plenty of other people that are watching that are able to answer as well. Feel free to interact with each other and comment and uh, help each other out. That's the whole point of this channel, right? All right, guys, I hope you liked that. I know it was a little bit longer of a video, but I had to get those nuts and bolts in there of how to actually do the process of the burr. It can be a little bit intimidating, but at the end of the day, it's a really simple process. Remember, you buy the property. You rehab the property. You put a tenant in place. You get a loan to refinance the property and pull all of your investment back out and then some. And then you repeat the process and then you just do it over and over and over. I guarantee you after the first one, the second, third, and fourth are way easier. And you can do it not on just residential properties but on commercial properties. Thanks again, I appreciate you guys so much. I'm gonna go ahead and link a couple videos in here. One about the books that I like to read that are in my top 10 that also includes this book right here that was essentially my Bible for this burr that we just talked about. And then I'll also link uh, to a video that I did on how I actually went from $3 in my bank account all the way up to the assets that I have in my possession or under my management now, which is well over $3 million. Thanks again for coming. Look forward to having you on the next one. And as always, here's to your wealth, guys.